you know, in comedy, there's there's sketch people, improv people, and there's also stand-ups. And I was never a stand-up, uh -huh. and it's such a different uh -huh. breed. You know, it's much much more of a lone wolf kind of vibe. And I was more comedy as a group sport. Yeah. So my thing was always making sure that the the group is 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 funny, as opposed to let me score in this. You'll be my, you know, lady in waiting in this. I'll be over here doing my thing. It was sort of yeah. like if I make you funny, it elevate, and I'm funny, it elevates the whole piece. Since we're here to talk initially about loot, let's talk a little bit about how loot came into your life. How did okay. how did you originally get pitched loot and hear about loot, or did you develop it yourself? No, it was developed by Alan Yang and Matt Hubbard, who I worked with on a show called Forever. Um, uh, Fred Armisen and I wanted to do a project together, and we wanted somebody else to do all the work. So we <laughs> asked, um, we looked for people that were interested in a, developing an idea, and we met with Alan Yang, who um, we, we knew of from lots of great people that um, we had in common, and he worked on Parks and Rec for many years. He's a, Funny guy, and um, he did Masters of None. Yes, yes. And um, we asked him to just send us ideas, and he and one of the fifty ideas, he said, "You guys are married, and you play ghosts." And we we're like, "Yes!" <laughs> and that was forever. And we really loved um, working together. Hubbard and Yang worked together on um, Parks and Rec as well, and so it was just a really easy fit. Um, which I'm at a place in my life now where I seek that out. So I knew that when they came to me um, with this project, A, I just thought it was exciting because I feel like the, the idea of a billionaire with too much money and um, this idea of a woman my age going through a divorce and trying to figure out what to do with her life and what to do with her billions all sounded like a great <laughs> place to swim. So, um, so I said yes. And did you initially do anything to shape the character or to create the character in a differently from how it was written or how it was initially? It's funny. It's the first time I've been given a lot of freedom, which was a little bit overwhelming at first. Uh -huh. um, and that's supposed to feel really good, and it's supposed to be an enormous compliment, but I didn't really know who the character was. I think it kind of felt like they were sort of saying, like, you'll be able to figure it out without <laughs> saying that. And um, and I do like to have a hand in what I create, so I was flattered, but it took a minute. It took a minute because she's not a character I can relate to other than like being a woman of a certain age. Um, oh, but you're giving away your billions. I mean, okay, so I'm a billionaire. <laughs> I wish. Because I, you know why? Because it just sounds, I, I realized having billions of dollars is like, it's like magic. Yeah, it's like the, it's like a, a ma it's like a magic trick. Like anything can happen. Uh, yeah, so no, I couldn't relate to the billions. I love the idea that it's like shit that's going on in the world, right? right. Obviously, there's the obvious cases, but I'm sure there's a lot of divorce in in billionaires, and I I um, I just think it's really interesting, and I think that you know there were so many stories ripped straight from the headlines. Obviously, you know. Billionaires not having a prenuptial agreement is also fascinating. Yes. And like yes. what that became and yeah. and how it's still playing out. And there's so there's so much to play in. What's also interesting is she does go from being completely spoiled and cl somewhat clueless to I haven't seen season two, but season at the end of season one, she's starting to you know there's definitely an evolution in terms of her mentality. I and hope so. I mean, I feel like I don't think I would have been able to wrap my head around doing it if it had just been, it has to go straight Moira Rose. Yeah. Schitt's yeah. Creek Moira Rose yeah. or un, uh, to, to be palatable. Yeah. If it's not that arch, yeah. then it has to have some sort of soul or some sort of, you have to have some sort of um, sense of common decency. Um, Moira Rose not having common decency is what's so wonderful about her. Yeah, yeah. But in this, you ha being the main character especially, I didn't want to play anybody shitty. Um, 
She's kind. She She's is just kind. A bit clueless. Yeah, and I like I like that the out of touch can give me the chance to do the fun because the comedy stuff is my favorite. Yeah. That's my bread and butter, and that's yeah. the part that I like the best. The more ridiculous, the better. But in order to ground it and in order to feel like we have a story that you want to come back to, I wanted her to be a person um, that you like. And yeah. what I like about the first season, but really far more the second season, is that um, it's an, it, it, it's um, um, a chance for her to f figure out who she is through the relationships that she's developing with all the people at the Wells Foundation. and. And I like that when and you her get assistant, to the assistant is crucial. Joel, Kim Joel, Booster, yeah, yes. I love their relationship. Their relationship is so. We great. were saying the other day, like we can't tell if it's like mommy baby or baby mommy <laughs> or husband wife or mommy mommy or it's so much role playing exactly. all the time. Exactly. Um, but it's a true love. Oh yeah. And I, I that's re that's those are, there's those, there's those many fun relationships you get to play. That's one of them. That I feel like. The person that will just not let you down, no matter what. They love you for exactly who you are when you're a fucking mess. Yeah. Um, that's really fun. And he's a fucking mess, so that's fun. <laughs> now, also the accoutrement that go with this character, was it? did you find her at all through the fashion, through the stuff, through the houses? Yes. I mean, it's incredibly fun to see how she lives. Yes, the fun, the fun thing with the first season was we actually shot at a house that was called The One, which I, it's like so ballsy to call your house The Where One. Where is The like, One? It's in Bel Air. Uh -huh. And when we uh, were able to shoot there, I believe it had been, um, I believe the developer had gone bankrupt and was in jail. Ah. Um, <laughs> so it was not finished, but it had like, what they called a discotheque in it, um, which I believe is a nightclub and like five pools and a juice bar and like, um, Five pools. Mm -hmm. Bowling alley. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty great. Um, it was fascinating. Fascinating. I took my family and my son um, who plays at, what's what's the game? Some nerd helped me out. What's the game that's like, uh, where you're building, uh, thank you. You don't even seem like a nerd. Um, <laughs> and yes, Roblox is a big hit too, but Minecraft. Um, we were walking through the whole house and he was saying like, this looks like it was designed on Minecraft. It was like <laughs> square, 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 big square, small square, 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 up up here and the marble, marble, marble. Um, it was fascinating though, it, because you get to a place I think in money where you, if you can just buy whatever you want, like. What do you do? What do you do? Yeah. Like, and where's the Five worth? Pools. And it was, it was wild. It was very strange. Um, that was really fun to just, yeah. I think one of the, one of the um, guilty pleasures of just watching the show and for us shooting the show is, is just, it's, I always say it's like Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, the show that was yeah. a big yeah. hit in, yeah. in the eighties. Yeah. Where you could see the insides of people's shows and then it was Cribs, I guess. Mm -hmm. Later on, um, sh shows, I meant to say homes. Yes. Um, but they were shows, but like, you know, you see that Shaq has a custom round mattress and he's got this slidey pool that looks like, you know, the Flintstones or whatever. And it's just wild. Like when you have more money than you know what to do with it, what do you do with it? Right, it's true. It's so fascinating. And for wh what? And probably it becomes easier to get into the character when you're in that yeah, environment. That's the fun. And then also just playing like the out of touch of it is is really like, and again, I come from sketch comedy. Yeah. Um, so I'm always needing to come back down a lot more, but like billionaire <laughs> sketch comedy is like, there's, not, there's no better combination. <laughs> so let's go back a little in your life. Were you a funny child? Yes. You were a funny <laughs> child. <laughs> Very. So you started out funny from the from the. I from think the... so. I was I was talking about this recently with somebody because um, what I'm fascinated by is I was raised by musicians. My parents are musicians, and as I go on in this life, the symbiotic relationship Music between and musicians yeah. and comedians it, it's they're kind of the same thing. They're both um, they kind of speak a common language. And it seems like um, something that's innate, that there can be a natural ability. 
an inclination um, to when people are incredible musicians, they just are. They're right. just it's like a, yeah. it's spiritual, you yeah. know. And I feel like it's like being an athlete too. Yes, like a absolutely. Great, they can play any sport. Yeah, and I, yeah. I just feel like I spoke comedy in that way. I also am a musical person because it's just in my blood and it's 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 just been normal to me my whole life. Com well, you're a very good singer. Thanks. Yeah, very good singer. I mean I'm a I'm a She has a she has a band. I she do. has a Prince cover band. I do. Yes. I, I'm a musical person and it's funny, I think I have a chip on my shoulder about like being like a singer. Like I sing, but um I've set this the bar way too high in my mind because my mother's voice is historic. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. like I sing, I sing pretty good, but it's not. <laughs> I don't consider myself. I and I I actually don't really sing in my own voice very often. I don't oh, really? really know what my singing voice sounds like because I <coughs> I sing in other people's voices. So you sing around the house. You're singing as Beyonce in the shower mm -hmm. and. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't sound like Beyonce, but I, maybe it I, does. I think it sounds <laughs> like it. I, you know, it's the thing in my brain that thinks I can be all of these things uh. and all these people. There's something I'm really, there's some light that I'm drawn to and I can't figure out still what it is, but there's something exciting. It's like when you see a great, when I see a great performance, I want to be that. Oh. Like um, Ryan Gosling in Barbie. Oh my God! It's the best performance I've seen in years. <coughs> oh, it's just profound. It's profound. It's sublime, as he would say. Uh, no shit, that's what he says. <laughs> yeah. And I and 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 I, there is an excitement like seeing Beyonce in concert uh, this summer. I went to see Beyonce in concert, and I just felt felt myself be you know the same age I was when I went to my first Madonna concert. Right. It's okay, I get it. <laughs> And um, and I just want to be. I just I want to be that thing. I want to be it. And so and yeah. And you remember the first person you made laugh, or the first time you sort of realized you were funny. I remember my friend Corazon when we were in. You had a like, friend named Corazon. I, I grew up in L.A. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a great name, Corazon. Corazon. Yeah. Yes. So it means heart, right? Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah, her mom was really trippy. Jeannie was a trip. <laughs> um, yeah, Corazon was crying. I think she got hurt or something. And I, I, I knew that making her laugh was going to make her forget she was crying. And I remember it. I remember that moment because I've thought about it over the years. Yeah. I mean, I did shows my entire childhood in my living room. My parents have seen Annie so many times. <laughs> the sun has come up. Yes, <laughs> more than just tomorrow. And, and the dog was in it, my best friend Jennifer was in it. We, you know, I, any movie, we saw fame and that was like, and you know, don't forget, we're talking about reenacting things that you couldn't just rewind or like watch on your phone over and over again. We saw right. it once at the theater and we were like, went home and then did a show. And we're like, can we go to the movies again? You know. You had to, yeah, you, you had to integrate. Yeah, integrate that stuff. It's like why I think I still use pen and paper to make myself remember things. Because if I type it in, it's gone. Right. Well, I think in general, it's better to use pen and paper. See? See? Yeah. <laughs> it's always better We're to use pen young. and paper. <laughs> I think it's going to come back. I do too. Yeah. I mean, it makes a It's like, also, I feel like we're not we're not hitting people over the head, going like, "You really should use pen and paper." Like, <laughs> but I think people are gonna feel, you know, that it's it's that um, that analog way of yeah. living that um, that I think has has serviced me for a long time. That really has helped me. And did you, when you were that young, did if people asked you what you wanted to do, would you say, "I want to be"? In comedy, I want to be an actress or? I think so. I definitely want to be an actress. I think I wanted to be the whole thing. Uh -huh. So like maybe the version of that that made sense people was like a Bette Midler, kind uh -huh. of like musical, comedy, but I'm sure there was drama in there too. Personality, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I on my sixth grade yearbook page, they ask you what you want to be when you grow up. And I was like, I want to have three kids, <laughs> two girls, one boy, but I, I, I wanted to, be on Broadway was what I said. In oh, my, really? my head, I thought like, I have to get to New York. I gotta get to New York. 
And then I wrote, I want to be on Broadway. It's so precocious. Like in parentheses, where all the stars live. <laughs> um, <laughs> but They're I want to. <laughs> They're all here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. But yeah, I wanted that. I wanted that um, excitement. Like, and it's like anything, you know, you grow up in Missouri, you want to get to LA. You grow up in LA, you want to get to New York. Um, I wanted to get to New York really bad. And, um, and I thought that that was everything. Broadway was like being the whole package. What did you audition for for SNL? Many people have told me that the hardest thing in their life was auditioning for SNL. Yes, they've like, told me that too. But not for you? <laughs> I didn't audition. You didn't audition? It was a weird fluke. That, that, I mean, thanks for that. I can't take credit. <laughs> it was a weird fuck up. I was supposed to audition. I was doing the Groundlings in Los Angeles. Um, and some people came to see me and they said, you should come out and audition. And I got my audition ready, just um, just like my other friends. And at the time, one of the, I, it wasn't a great, by the way, it, was a, it wasn't a great audition that I had prepped. I wasn't like, I'm gonna get them with this one or anything <laughs> in retrospect, but you have, I you think have to I was- do an imperson- You have to do a- Yeah, I was Gwen, St- Gwen Stefani singing in a bar mitzvah was one of them. <laughs> and then it was like, um, kind of a Giselle Bunchen like uh, talk show. Ho- I mean, that's <laughs> kind of all I remember. And um, and I had pieces that I had written um, that I was performing at the time at the Groundlings. And then I had a manager at the time that said that called me and said, "Don't go to the audition. It's the worst year yet. There's something horrible with the contracts. Don't worry. You can go next year. You shouldn't go. You shouldn't go. You shouldn't go." And I was a kid. I think I was like 25, 26. And um, I listened to her and I didn't go. And I was really depressed. I immediately realized that was stupid. I just listened to one person's opinion. Um, And I kind of put my tail between my legs and I went back to the Groundlings and I did other stuff and I got another job. And then they came back and they said, would you like to come back another time? And um, do you have a tape you can send? And I've sent a VCR, VHS, VHS. VCR, Jesus, my <laughs> a VHS tape of some sketches I did. And I did, I went out and I met Lorne. And um, he said, why do you want to work here? And I said, because I like to wear wigs. I mean, it was all bad. Like, <laughs> I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have gotten the job based on that. Um, but then they brought me out. It was, in a way, it was an audition, but they brought me out for the last three shows of the 25th season. And it was kind of like. So they put you right on the air. Well, they had us write, and they and I remember the the other um, visiting uh, writer, not performer, was Zach Galifianakis, and so the two wow. of us were in an office together, and we walked back to our hotel like, "What's happening?" I was like, "I don't know." <laughs> no, we didn't know what was going on. We were writing stuff. Um, I didn't get my sketch on, but it was the the sketch that I I wanted to do an MTV like VJ thing. And at the time, Anna Gaster was writing something similar, so they combined them, and I played an MTV VJ named Ananda Lewis, and it was my first, that was my your first, first week. Thing. Yeah. Wow. Were you um, nervous? Yeah, yeah. You don't learn how to how to work there. No one, no one teaches you. You just throw you into the water. Uh huh. And there's now I can't work without cue cards, <laughs> but there are cue cards, and you have to learn how to, you know look at the cue card and make it seem like you're not staring and reading and make it seem like you're in the scene with the person. So normally, if the other actor's here, the cards will be here. So we're never really looking at the other actors, which I found very uncomfortable. Right. Really like to look. dig <laughs> in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was really interesting. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good at trying to look unflappable. I was flapped. <laughs> but I was trying to look unflappable. Yeah. And did you come? And you were on the next week too. Mm-hmm. I think I made it to all. I think I made it to all three. But then I didn't know until all summer. Like it was like radio silence. Oh wow! Yeah, it's so intense. And I lived in Los Angeles at the time, so I think I got. I had like six weeks, maybe less. Once I got the job, I, I moved out here, and that was right before September 11th. That was when I moved. Oh my gosh! Yeah. What do you think you learned most from being on SNL from Lauren? What was the biggest thing that impressed you at the time? Or even, because you keep going back, so there must I do. be. And I find that it's, you're not the only one. It must be weirdly, people yeah. talk about it being the hardest thing in their life, but yeah. yet seem very addicted to it. 
Yes, and it becomes <laughs> absolutely, and it's you know, don't forget the adrenaline element is so addictive too. And there's, there is truly nothing, and I mean nothing else like it. Yes, there, uh, nothing else satisfies that. Nothing else scratches that itch for me. I know now in my life, especially having left and come back, I am a live performer. I think that's where I'm, uh -huh. I'm more well-suited. Uh -huh. And it gives me all of the things that I need. And now I'm... Now it's a place of comfort and it's a home. So, and I have a family there. And I think that's the difference. And I think especially for me, when I became a mother and worked there, my relationship with Lauren changed for both of us. Right. He became far more um, aware of, um, he was just more careful. He wanted to make sure I was okay. He became far more of a, the father figure that you expect, but truly, truly, I think I was I was pregnant, but I hadn't told him yet. And I had done a sketch where I had to fall through a piano and it was made out of styrofoam. And I was fine and I knew I was fine, but I told him I was pregnant because it was about past the three months. And then he was so worried because I had fallen through a piano. Yeah, I'm you know? surprised you weren't worried. <laughs> I knew, well, I knew I was pregnant, so I knew how to, I knew I was fine. It wasn't that bad of a fault, but it was, um, <laughs> yeah, no. And I think in those, like now I'm probably more worried. At the time, I think when we worked there, we just felt like we could do anything. I don't know. Well, that brings up a, something I think is true for you and everything you do is that you're fearless. Hmm. You have a fearlessness yeah, about that's you. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> you do, you feel like there's no place you wouldn't go. Huh. In a great way, in a, in a fantastic way. Like, why are you laughing? <laughs> it's true. I it's mean, funny because like, I feel like, like a fall through a piano, fall, yeah. you know, get up there and sing your, like, Beyonce on in front of everyone with the wind machine on you. Yeah. You know, there's 18 more I could name off the top of my You're head. You're totally right. And I think it's back to that thing of, like, there's something that I need to do. There's a joy in it, though. Yeah. There's sort of a joy in the fearlessness. Aside from the fact that you're great at everything you do. Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> I mean, I, there is a joy, and I think that's what drives me. And I think that's, I, I hear myself saying sometimes, like, oh, yeah, that'll be fun. Or let's do this project. <laughs> that'll be fun. Like, how old are you? Fun? But it, there, is a, there is a joy, and I, I think that does drive me a bit. But it's funny to hear anything about me described as fearless, because that's just not who I am. Really, you don't, you feel afraid when, oh. before you start? Uh, not so much in performing. I think in life. Ah. I've just led a very careful life. I don't... What? Yeah. Not as a performer. Not as a performer. Yeah. No, I mean, it couldn't be less careful. That's what I mean. I think yeah. it's just so interesting because that's not who I am at home. Oh. I never have a second cup of coffee at home. <laughs> um, no, I don't... Uh, I just don't... I'm so You never careful. fall through any pianos at home? No way. <laughs> No way. But, you know, I mean, it's like, since this might as well be my therapy session, um, obviously, you know, when you lose a parent when you're a little kid, you're aware that life is short. Is short. And yeah. so I was a very, I was a very afraid child. I was very nervous about things. And so I didn't, I didn't play a lot of heavy duty group sports. I didn't get hurt. I didn't break any bones. You know, I was very careful. Um, but I don't feel that way about myself as a performer. I just feel that way about myself in my life, if that makes sense. It does, but it's also interesting that you can split the two so yeah, easily. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't, it's not I mean, premeditated. I, I guess it, the reverse would be, have you ever read anything and said no? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Well, nudity, let's be honest. This is, <laughs> I didn't get into the biz for that. So, and it's just like, yeah, dude, I'm, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. Um, yeah. I mean, I haven't been offered a lot of action roles. I'm sure I did have to do some stunt things and some things have been more comfortable than others. But usually, you know, they make you feel safe and wires and flying and yeah. all fighting and all that stuff. There's some stunts in Bridesmaids, too. Yeah. <laughs> when it was originally um, when the whole shitting in the street. Yeah. <laughs> element was introduced. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, I think that scene, as 
difficult as it is to watch, is very cathartic for a lot of people because many people have had an experience where things have gone terribly I'm wrong. I'm going to say that. maybe all of us. Yes, to be exactly. Honest. Sure. I was probably. I mean, I vomited in the subway, so there you go. I mean, you must have had fun before that. Well, sort of. I mean, it was just the food. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, when it was originally, first of all, it was not in the script originally. Not to say I wouldn't have done the movie. I would have done the movie anyway, but it wasn't. There was never a, a bad food incident. And um, <laughs> Bridesmaids was a very interesting process because we workshopped it the entire time we were oh, for really? weeks. It was written. Kristen and Annie wrote it. Um, but because Judd Apatow was producing it, his um, he really wanted us to workshop it. And so we would all get together and we would improvise. Oh. We would read the script. We'd read the scenes. We would improvise the scenes. And then he had someone there writing Recording everything it. down. And then they would type it up for us. And then we'd come back and there'd be a new scene and a new scene and oh, a new wow. scene. It was a lot. Wow. Um, Did your character change a lot? No, just there was just a lot more intimacy. I think because I think I was really hired because they really liked my chemistry with Kristen because yeah. we had just met, we had just started working together at SNL. And we were actual friends, right? And I think there was something nice about that because I'm. It's weird for me to be like the straight guy in it because I'm not really the straight guy in anything. Yeah. But I think our relationship grounds it so much for her that I feel like that was so. Yeah, they allowed that to blossom, that relationship to blossom. You were but, kind of the princess in it, too. Yeah. You I got felt to like be a, the princess. I did. You yeah. Know, you, the one that gets to wear the, the dress. Yeah. And, yeah. It's pretty rare for me, too. And you have everyone trying to be your friend. And I know. Working. It's so fun yeah. to get to do that. <laughs> it's amazing how few, how rare I mean, Rose I've been able to do that. I mean, Rose to be your bestie. Oh, my God. I was yeah. I was quoting her the other day when she was saying, Kup kung ka. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was written. It was um, it was written. The stage direction was, I shoot across the stage violently as though I've been shot by a bullet. And I was like, what? Because I from taking a shit in your pants. That seems intense. So we brought it down a little bit. I see. Yeah. So it wasn't as violent as it was as it was written. Well, but you d but what you said earlier is interesting also about the core relationship with you and Kristen and also did SNL give you that foundation to sort of cuz the women of SNL have all your generation of women of SNL have stayed so close. Yeah, which and, is kind of one of those fluky rare and you have so things. much chemistry when you're all together. Well, the the group of women that are in Bridesmaids a lot, the majority of us have all crossed paths because of the Groundlings. Uh -huh. The majority. Uh -huh. You know, that's where I met Melissa McCarthy and I knew Wendy a bit. Kristen and I were never together at the Groundlings, but we were both there. So we kind of were in each other's... Frame of reference. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and spoke that vision. same yeah. language and then obviously because of SNL. Um, yeah, which was really interesting because that gave like a natural chemistry. Rose just showed up <laughs> and was unbelievable and just was. And I, I thought she knew everybody because there really was an element of chemistry there. Um, she was just so incredibly natural. Well, it was also a groundbreaking movie in the sense that it was about women together. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're men, of course, but they're kind of the peripheral mm -hmm. characters. And it's always made me a little sad that there wasn't a sequel or, you know, because it was such a huge hit. Yeah. It was funny because, and I, I, I'll talk about it for the rest of my life, but that's okay with me, um, just how odd it was for us that when the movie came out, the story was not just about the, the it being a, a strong comedy, that it was funny because women were in it, and isn't that crazy? And we were compared to The Hangover. It was a female right. hangover, female hangover, and I kept yeah. like, female hangover? like. The Hangover was never in our minds when we were making it. And also, these were some of the funniest people I already knew. We thought we were getting away with murder by, let, by someone allowing us to make a movie together because when you get to be with so many of those, it was like a murderer's row of all these comedians. And right. we, I knew how funny everybody was, but we, I remember, I think it was the day of the, like, well, the, the bridal shower or something with all the puppies and someone yeah. saying, 
God, this is so much fun to make. I hope people think this is funny because we think it's funny. Right. Which to me is always like the golden tick. Right. Like that's how of you course. know something's of good course. is if you think if it's you funny. Think it funny. Yeah. And um, but I didn't know if any if it was going to be well received. I didn't think it was going to. I didn't think oh for sure it's going to be a hit because I'm never that's never never that's never on my radar anyway. So all of it was a surprise. What was more surprising was the whole sort of quantifying it or justifying it with another movie which had nothing to do with the movie that was strange and um, of course very male no shit yeah, yeah. it was weird exactly. and it was it, and, and it continues to be weird i watched it with barbie and oppenheimer and we were talking about greta actually brought up which i thought was so interesting it never occurred to me um that that movie in particular was one of the many stepping stones to making Barbie possible. Of course. And I thought that was so interesting because they've had a similar experience where their movie was always compared to another male movie. I, th I just, just, it just really is exhausting. Exhausting. And right? Yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah, it's just dumb. Quack. It's just dumb, but it also feels more like it just feels like we live in a time where there's all these, uh, forgive me if this is wrong, it's just my um, my own personal theory. At, at the time with Bridesmaids, it felt, like a, it felt like a journalistic trope. It was like, hey, here's a story. And then it just like caught on like wildfire. And now I feel like everything has to be a story. It's like- Right, exactly. Why can't it just be a movie? You know. Well, that's also the thing about comedy that's so interesting. It's such a undervalued, resource. Mm -hmm. I mean, people love a comedy and at the same time they put comedy in such a other category. Yeah. Like it's not as important. It's as... an ugly, it's an ugly step sibling for sure. Well, yeah. I don't think it's ugly, but uh, yes. Clearly I don't either, but, <laughs> but, but I, I think, think in the regard. But I think the way that the audience or the world sees, mm. you know, I think Barbie, for instance, not to go down this road, mm -hmm. but it felt to me like the reason people did not nominate Greta was not so much about female issues, but about comedy. comedy. Yeah. About the fact that the movie was about a doll and that it was funny and right. that people laughed when they went to see it. I agree it. with that. And I think that was more, I mean, it's unfortunate all the way around. Yeah. But do you find that you want to be seen in, does that bother you or do you? No, because I understand it and yeah. now. I, I, I'm sure when I was younger and far more ambitious and had more energy, I probably was, was bothered by it a bit more. I understand it and it's exactly what you're saying too. It's sort of like, and I think it took also years of being a cast member at Saturday Night Live to see you get the beautiful people would come in and they'd want to be Fun funny. like us, funny. they want to be funny. Yeah, we were the funny kids, and yeah. we were kind of like the oh, underdogs. No, it's like the thrill to host yeah. the show. It's like, you know, like a big, big deal in people's lives. But they, so many people would say, like, I just want to be funny, yeah. and it was so interesting to hear that come out of people's mouths, you know, or that they wanted to kind of like be like us, like the the kids. We just felt like kids, but um, I I get it. I understand it a lot more now, and I don't think I'd have it any other way. But it's interesting what what the perception is, for sure, from the other side. Did you have a favorite character on SNL? Did you have a favorite character to play? To play? I went through stages. For a long time, it was Donatella, because it was really Aww. like, <laughs> thanks. It was fun. It was really fun. And also, fun. people didn't really, you were Donatella. Yeah. Because people didn't, didn't really, really know, know who Donatella, Donatella was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they knew who she was, but they didn't know what her, the whole persona of Donatella. Yeah. I feel like there's a little bit of Donatella and loop, loop too. I you think you do? I yeah. think there is too. Yeah, I think there's a little. The grand the and grand. sort of like the, like we can do, uh, you yeah. know. The, the, and a bit of the divine quality too. Yeah. Her. Yeah. Well, she also, I remember when we were make when we were doing the sketch, because it became like- Did you my, write it or was I it? I wrote it with Emily Spivey, uh -huh. who's my dear friend, who I've, um, who's created a lot of stuff for me and also written with me over the years. We started The Groundlings together. Oh, wow. And she came to SNL the following year. And, and did you see Donna, how did it come into your mind? It was something that, that Emily wrote and she knew me well, so she wrote it with me in mind. And then, um, and then, uh, and we went full, like, whole hog from uh -huh. the beginning, like brought me out, like, you know, brought me out like Cleopatra and with like, you know, boys put me on like a, like a bed. They carried me out on a, on a settee <laughs> and, um, and 
I think the one we did with Mick Jagger, like I was in the bath and the phone fell in the bath and I got electrocuted and I loved it. <laughs> like we made her, we made her very superhuman. We didn't yeah. make her a real person, right. you know, which I really liked. But while we were making them, she, I would hear through the grapevine. She loved it. That she loved it. She loved it, yeah. And yeah. I thought that was, I mean, what a compliment. But she's always played the diva. Right. She seems, as I've as I've gone on and learned a lot more about her, she's a very, like, quiet person. But I think the persona that she developed was very fabulous. Yes. And so she loved that we were playing Fabulosity. into that. Yes. Yeah. And so that was your favorite for a while? I think that was my favorite for a while. Emily Spivey, who is truly my my soulmate, my comedy wife, all of all of the above. Um, she wrote uh, Oprah for me. She wrote Whitney for me. Um, I didn't think that I could ever play Oprah Winfrey. I didn't. It never occurred <laughs> to me, and I also didn't think that I could do an impression because the, the first thing she wrote was Oprah's favorite things because right. she was more. She was more in love with the idea of how funny the whole concept is of. Right giving things away and having people lose their minds. Right. So we were we were playing that for it, but then it sort of evolved into more of a character. Um, and then later on when I got more comfortable, um, I guess actually um, Rachel Dratch and I used to write, again with Spivey, we used to write um, an AV club. It was like, it was two kids. It was like teens that had a I club. That. Yeah, and I it was a very that. sweet. Yeah. That was what I was really proud of. And then later, when I felt more comfortable, it was um, Bronx Beat with Amy Poehler. Uh -huh. yeah. And that was, again, with Spivey. Fantastic. That was yeah. great. Thanks. But that was more like, I've been here for a while. I know how, it was looser. And it was, you know, I think over the years, people assumed that SNL was, in, there were improvised moments and there were rarely improvised moments unless someone was like, you know, laughing and. Right, or about you to know, crack up. Yeah. But in general, everything was... But you never broke. I don't feel like I did. No, you never broke. I've heard this from other people, that you were the only Very one... Very rarely. Who, you were the only one who never broke. Very serious. Yeah. <laughs> there, was a, there was a sketch that you're I think... It. I think you're it was it so bad. It. it went so badly that they... In the days that they didn't air the show live uh -huh. in on the West Coast 830, I think they fixed it for air on the West Coast, but... It was a sketch that Fred Armisen and I wrote, and there was a live parrot in it. Why we didn't ask for it, I don't know. <laughs> and this parrot made the weirdest sound. <laughs> there was an Alec Baldwin sketch, and it was one of the strangest frequencies I've ever heard, and it made the weirdest sound, and we both, and it shocked us, and we, we got scared, and we kind of stared at each other, and then I had to try really hard to stop laughing, and it was impossible, and I think they fixed it, because it, it was a shit show. It was a terrible, <laughs> terrible sketch, but. <laughs> So let's go forward to the variety show you did with Marty Short, which I thought was so fabulous. Thank you. Was that something you'd always wanted to do? Was that something that you had thought about? Because it was so, I loved it. It was so happy. It was happy and I'd always wanted to do it and I think it's the same. And you were really singing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I was born in the wrong time, obviously. <laughs> And, I don't know. I like that you're here. I mean, I'm glad I'm here, <laughs> but like all the things I love are definitely a lot of bygone days things. And you want a showstopper. Yeah, and people don't really do that anymore. And um, we just wanted to do it. And I, I had done a special. I had, and Lauren produced it, and we did it in LA. But it was just like, no, we need to be in New York. So when we decided to do it again, it was Lauren's idea to do it with Marty which was not, it was not a twist my arm situation. <laughs> I have loved Martin Short for so long, for so many years, and he is possibly one of the best humans on the planet. And, Very um, funny. And, and the fact that Lorne considered us a duo in his eyes, just like, it, meant, it, it meant everything. And talk about fearless. He's, <laughs> Marty will do anything <laughs> for a laugh. So, I mean, yeah. I once saw him, he was doing, um, uh, Jiminy Glick, and he had like a roll of donuts, and he <laughs> took them all, and I don't know how he, they just all went down his throat. <laughs> I don't understand it. It was one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. We knew that the format was correct. It's hard to um, still create, there's still an innocence missing, I feel like. Also, it's like the foundation of all of the variety that we're used to today right. and what we, what everything comes from. Right. And it was such a standard for so many years. And then it just 
disappeared. Wow. Except for technically, really, Saturday Night Live. Like, there's just not that much variety unless it's a special, you know? So it's tough because it's a, for, I, if you told me that I had to do a variety show for the rest of my life, I'd go, oh, okay. <laughs> but um, but it's hard, it's, it's a hard Format. climate for it. Did you do it on a stage? Yeah, we built, we were actually um, at Rockefeller Center. There's a studio across from Fallon where we did it. It used to be the old Letterman and then it was the old um, Conan studio. Right, that's not that big. I've been in It's really small. Yeah. Really small, yeah. But it was like, you know, for that one, Lauren pulled out all the stops and made sure that we had the best people. And and so it ended up becoming this like kind of like um, severed arm of Saturday Night Live. Like uh, we had all the same crew and we had wow. Keenan and so, and we had Lauren obviously, but it was different. It was just different. Cause and, it wasn't live though, was it live? No, it, well we did it live for an audience, but then it was edited. So it, there's something about that that changes it. Huh. Yeah. Were you sad when you left SNL? Was that a sad Very. day? Yeah, I, it's, I, I couldn't figure out what I wanted. I really wanted to be um, a parent. I wanted to have a baby. I fell in love, I wanted to have a baby, but I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. And then I wasn't sure I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. I, you know, just like many um, things in our lives that we think are going to make us happier and solve all of our problems. I was a little depressed at my dream job. My, my roommate, Emily Spivey, my office mate wrote, my, she's Southern, she wrote, my dream job is depressing, y'all, on, on the wall <laughs> in pencil, and it was there for years. Um, it's never what you think it's gonna be, and it was really stressful, and it was hard, and we were, you know, I, I never considered myself a writer. I wrote everything, um, you know, that I put up at the table every week, so I was writing up, you know, till eight or nine in the morning every week and, and putting yourself out there, and it, it, it was overwhelming. We weren't, you know, I wasn't doing anything else. It was just devoting my life to that. And then there was a period of time where I felt like I don't know if I'm hitting a ceiling here, if I'm not funny enough. I don't know if I don't, I don't know if I want to be here anymore. I want to have a baby. And so I decided to have a baby. I didn't think it was going to happen as quickly as it did, but it happened really fast. And then, um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, we'll clap first, for the baby. First time's a charm. And then, um, uh, <laughs> thank you. And then, um, and then I really had to decide, but I knew that I wanted to come back once I'd had her. But it was hard to do. I did it for a while. It was a real balancing act. And then um, and then I knew it was time to go. I mean, I left twice. The first time I left, I said goodbye, I cried, and Paul was taking <laughs> pictures. And it was like, and then I came back one more year. Because Lauren said, um, you know, we need someone to, uh, to play Obama. And I was like... Okay, <laughs> so who do you want? Was, well, you, and we did try it, and it was fucking terrible. Uh -huh. um, and we tried it with Obama, which was really embarrassing. You tried to, you were Obama with Obama? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it was really bad, and that didn't work, thank God. You were like dueling Obamas? Yeah, it was a Halloween party, and um, it was one of those like tap you on the shoulder uh -huh. thing, and uh, no, it's me. Oh my God. It was bad. He was very sweet about it. That's I fine. was <laughs> mortified. Um, but uh, that's, that's a very intense thing to have to do. Yeah. I mean, you've acted opposite the real versions of people you're playing a lot, but I don't know. Obama would seem a little. He was lovely about it. I didn't really understand the reference. It must be a men's suit reference, but I remember that Tom Broker, our costume designer, put me in a little Brooks Brothers suit or yeah. something. And yeah. I had my old Scott Joplin wig on, and I'm, he's very tall. Very tall. And I was standing there getting ready, and I said, how do I look? And he said, I don't wear a three-button suit. And I remember being like, <laughs> I was like, I don't get it. <laughs> but I thought, like, maybe it's like, maybe that's like a clowny look for a grown man. I don't know. I have no idea. Boy suits, men suits, I don't know. Um, but actually, that year, was the writer's strike, it was 2007. So wow. we took a break, an indefinite break and I just went back home and it was really hard to watch the show. When I was at home, I saw all my friends playing mm. and having fun together and I wasn't there and it was, it was brutal mm. for a while. And I felt like a ghost. I felt like I was watching 
everyone have fun without me in a place that I knew, but I couldn't be there. It just felt bad. Wow. It made me so sad for so long. And then they all finally left, <laughs> except for <laughs> Keenan. He's still there. <laughs> <laughs> and you keep coming back. And I keep coming back, and now I we feel love like when you come back. Well, it's nice Don't because we love when Nate, she comes back. thanks. Yeah. It's nice, yeah. and it feels like I was saying to someone today. It feels like um, like a guest in your parents' home. You're like I'm in the guest <laughs> bathroom using the nice soap now. You know, <laughs> but, you know, you feel like you a grown get to be up. At the end part too. Yeah, yeah. The hugging part. And it's all the good stuff. It's yeah. all the stuff. It's you don't remember any of you don't remember any of the pain of childbirth. <laughs> it's just all the good, all the good yummy stuff. So one of the things that I've noticed since you were at SNL though is that you are really embracing of the women that worked there and also women in general. I mean, you're very good at picking people that have comedic or even just acting chops mm. and you've sort of started being more of a producer as mm -hmm. well as a star yourself. Do you like that? Is that fun for you? I do. Or is that something you want, wanted to do? I, it was a natural kind of backing into it progression, um, especially when I found out that I had the ability to do that. Like and Natasha that... Lyonne, basically, you reinvented her entire career. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> well, I think she'd already reinvented it, to be fair, but I think that... You helped it along. Well, that's sweet of you yeah. to say. I don't. I, I don't feel that great. way, but I do feel like I think she's said that. It's not just me. Oh, really? Yes, in wow. a New Yorker profile. That's yes, nice. Yes, I never felt that way. But you know, people didn't know we were old friends, uh, you know, for so long, and so I think it was funny to see this connection. But they didn't realize. I mean, she was one of the first people I met when I moved here. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. and um, and so it kind of it was this nice. We always had this friendship that just felt very loving and and familial. Again, I'm always drawn to family, and um, and she was always around when we were doing the show and friendly with a lot of us. And she was the younger kid, kind of. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I've always been kind of I don't know uh, sis sisterly. How do you say? Not fraternal, not paternal, not maternal. Uh, fr uh, sor sororital. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the correct word. Um, you like women. I like women. Yeah, yeah. So sue me. Um, <laughs> it felt very natural, and it was actually her idea, and um, it just felt right. You were saying something earlier about the women at SNL, and I never really, it never really occurred to any of us when it was happening, but when I was on the show, that group, group of women that I worked with, we were all weirdly very similar types of people. Uh -huh. And I think that was why we all clicked in that way. Because we've talked about it so much. We were all good girls, good students, good daughters. Um, we worked hard. We, you know, we, we, we all had similar backgrounds, either Second City Groundlings. or the Groundlings. And it just kind of made sense. And, and especially you know, in comedy, there's there's sketch people, improv people, and there's also stand-ups. And I was never a stand-up, uh -huh. and it's such a different uh -huh. breed. You know, it's much much more of a lone wolf kind of vibe. And I was more comedy as a group sport. Yeah. So my thing was always making sure that the the group is 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 funny, as opposed to let me score in this. You'll be my, you know, lady in waiting in this. I'll be over here doing my thing. It was sort of yeah. like if I make you funny, it elevate, and I'm funny, it elevates the whole piece. Um, and we all just kind of wrote that way and had that same background. So, yeah, and and I didn't realize. I think it was also because at the time, I know it was because there was such a big spotlight on Tina being the first female head writer there, and. Um, it was such a razzly dazzly big deal, and it was a big deal, but it was less of a big deal internally. It was more just like, okay, great, let's let's you know continue to do what we're doing if we've got this this good light on us kind of thing. Um, but it was all very normal, and and I was also just lucky too. And you know, I I worked with Emily Spivey, who was a writer there, and so we had our background. And then obviously the girls, Rachel and Tina and Amy all came from the same theater and um, 
And then that you stuff did wine, matters. You did wine country together. Yeah, and it was yeah. born out of the same thing. It was like, well, it was actually born out of this tradition where we've started taking um, trips, together. trips together for people's 50th. Mine, mine's overdue. We need to do it. There have been too many strikes and Do you pick pandemics. a place to go? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And does it tend to be some place where there will be alcohol? <laughs> um, well, that was the first one. It was Dra it was Dratch's birthday, and she wanted to go to wine country, so we went to wine country, and and then the next year was Anna's birthday, and that was uh, I, I got bitten by a black widow spider, and so oh, they no. they like weaved that into it somewhere, and there's did, always some fun story did you that gets almost die. I didn't. I mean, I'm okay. <laughs> I can, you know, I can solve crime now. But I, I am. Um, you have a superpower. I have a superpower. Yeah, good to I'm know. here in Gotham City to, to save all of you. I, um, I weirdly had know. been stung by a bee like the week prior, and I have a little bit of a, a reaction. So I was taking medicine already because oh I God. was like, I had this like weird swollen thing. So I think it saved my, saved me. Well, that's good, and you have the superpower now. And so. I have the superpower, <laughs> which is pretty cool. But that was, I thought wine countries felt very, you know, again, sort of a girl moment, a girl power moment. There's something really nice about the fact that I'm very romantic about the idea of people working together and doing what you're saying about making Absolutely. it better, the collective being yeah. better than the individual. I love that yeah. stuff. That has always been my thing, and... I think because we all wrote together, Liz Kukowski and Emily Spivey who wrote it, Liz also wrote at the show, and we're all old friends. And it, yeah. what a luxury to get to a place where you can create the things that you're doing, and that was the goal of it, truly. And now I'm at a place in life where I feel like, oh, that's been set up in a way that feels good. So back to the producing part of it, if I can find those moments to have that participation, uh, in that way, it does make a world of difference. And I definitely spent years where I wasn't comfortable or I wasn't happy or I didn't feel fulfilled or I didn't feel heard. So yeah, sometimes you have to produce things in order to make them more palatable, but so far so good. I've never thought like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna produce a bunch of stuff. Like I just, <laughs> it was more, it started out as something that Natasha was really passionate about and she's passionate about an entire realm of things. And for me, and we're, we're kind of, we, we are that odd couple in the sense that our speeds are different, uh -huh. but what was nice was we bounce each other out quite a bit. So that was nice for the beginning of the duration of Animal doing that. And then I think it slowly made me realize like, yeah, I do like having a hand in what I'm doing. I'm just very slow and very methodical about the things that I want to create. Cause I feel like I have I don't have enough time to do all the things I want to do. If you could play anything, what would you play? What would be your dream role? Ooh, I, why don't I know the answer to that right away? <laughs> I mean, it's it big. It could be it's, something it's, not it's in comedy. It could be something. True. Yeah. It's big. I know it's big, large. Like, like I played a villain. We got to do Disenchanted. We got to do... Um, yeah, Disenchanted looked very fun. It looked fun, but nobody saw it because it came out during COVID. Yeah. Um, but it was big. It was like big arch, like nasty, evil queen stuff. Excuse me, that was fun. Like I want to do more of that. And you got to sing. Yeah, and I got to sing, and I got to sing like a real Disney... I mean, it was major. Um, I still want to, uh, I still want to do something live. Is, like theater? It, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like a musical or like a? I used to think it was a musical and maybe it is, but boy, does that look hard. That looks every night Like too. my thing, t yeah, the every night thing freaks me out. And also the and, thing and of like, I'm fading my Twice a day. For, for tonight. Like, yeah, yeah. I would be, my anxiety would be through the fucking roof yeah. all day long. Just like, <laughs> I gotta sing tonight. I gotta sing tonight. Oh, I gotta, gotta sing tonight. I gotta sing tonight. I gotta sing tonight. Oh, I gotta, gotta sing tonight. I gotta sing tonight. I gotta sing tonight. I don't wanna lose my and voice. Dance. I gotta sing tonight. And dance. Yeah. Yeah. But then when you're on the stage, you're like, yeah. ha cha cha. <laughs> and it's fun. So, then, I mean, yes, but I, I really, I do have something in my head that I wanna do. My, my very sweet 18-year-old daughter said that I should be an 
EGOT winner. So I have to figure out how to, <laughs> I have to figure out how to get that Tony. So I'm figuring it out. I don't know how to do it yet, but I'm working on it. That's exciting. Yeah. Does she have a plan? Does she have nope. a? Nope. No plan. <laughs> no plan at all. She just thought it would be great. I never thought I'd win an Emmy. You know, I never, it never occurred to me that anything that I was doing, and, and the first Emmy I won was for an animated show. And then I won it in COVID, so no one really saw that. So it was just kind of like, I, it's all very strange and, and, and feels very abstract. Do you love doing animated? Because you're so good at animated. I do love it. Yeah, you I mean. in your pajamas. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, I wish I were in my pajamas more often, but, but you, do, you do have the, the choice if you so desire. <laughs> I wish that it were more, um, I wish that it were more interactive. In, in a perfect world, I'd be in the room with the fellow actors a lot uh -huh. more. That's very um, Do, Are you in the room, I know that you guys all know this, but I don't. Are you in the room with the image? It depends, uh -huh. it, like what stage it's in, and sometimes you are, but it just depends. So otherwise you're just, they do the, to your voice then? Yeah, usually they develop it to your voice. Some, I've come in, some things in the, that's been very anim, loosely animated and you're sort of, there's sort of clearly you're an afterthought and then you're sort yeah. of dropped in and then they animate around the voice, yeah. That's interesting. It's very interesting. But I like when you can interact with another person. Right. That makes a you know big difference. And some of the stuff we were doing on Big Mouth. Because um, Big Mouth is pretty intense. Mm. Yeah, well, before COVID, we were doing a lot of it in person, and I was doing the majority of my stuff with Nick, and Nick Roll plays so many of the the voices. Right. That was great. You just had Nick and, like, one other person in the room. It was like having six people in you, the room. Yeah. Did you win an Emmy for Big Mouth, too? Yes. I won two or three. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I won three. Three for Big Mouth. And you don't remember? You have three sitting around? Well, I have five at home. I know. <laughs> Do they talk to each other? Do they have conversations? Yeah, the big mouth ones are really embarrassing because they have really horrible titles, like my first orgasm. <laughs> like, and I got it sent in the mail because it was during COVID and right. my, my then eight-year-old daughter opened the box, like, let's see your Emmy. <laughs> and she says, mommy, what's an orgasm? It was horrible, it was horrible. <laughs> I won't ask how you explain that. I didn't. I just said <laughs> a I, fun time. I just I just started laughing. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I'm sure she won't. I think I that. said ask your father. Or <laughs> and do they do? Where do you keep your Emmys? In my office. Yeah. I mean, there's no spa I I don't have that kind of house. That's like here's a <laughs> area. It's like it's a joke. It's a. I mean, there's six people in my house and three dogs and. And the Emmys. And, and, the and, Emmys. and five, five Emmys. Five Emmys. Yeah. <laughs> have, did you get to make acceptance speeches? Just once. And how was that? Um, but it was on Zoom. Oh, um, that's disappointing. It was disappointing. No, I definitely have never done that. That makes me so nervous thinking about it. Oh, you'll be great. Because I think I'm just going to start crying and like thank my dad really hard. Like, but that's, that's I know, good. I know, People it's so will love sweet. That. People will love that. Yeah, well, I, what it makes me think of is just like how much it boils back down to this th feeling of this person rooted for me my whole life and made me feel like I could do this and really do anything, all the things I've ever done in my life. Wow. I feel like my dad has made me feel that way. And how lucky am I that I had a parent that said, yeah, you can you can do that. It does, not everybody gets that luxury. Oh no, yeah. Here's to your dad. I know, he's the best. He's a pretty amazing guy. What's his favorite thing that you've done? I don't know. I mean, he was actually, he was with me when I did the national anthem. He was on the floor, I had him come to the floor. Oh, I love that. That was really cool. And I great. and it was it felt very, I was proud of myself because it felt like one of those life moments where I never, in all the years that I was there, I rarely had a good idea where I thought, this will be a good idea for a sketch. It right. was sort of like, oh, this character and the thing and write it, but I felt like, I can see it clearly from beginning to end. I know what I want it to look like. And so it just felt really good. And then the performance of it was what was so exciting. And then coming off stage and feeling like I know that went well was very rare for me. Huh. Not because I beat myself up in any way, but I just didn't have, I didn't normally 
do pieces like that. Yeah. It was a performance right. piece. And seeing my dad there beaming was so sweet. And oh, that's so great. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. So that, nice. So those are the moments in life. Those are deathbed moments. <laughs> so morbid, but so true. You're like, when your life is flashing before your eyes, those are the, those are the good ones. So you're was know. it important to you to get back to loot? Because we're going to see the trailer, I guess, for the second season. Um, did they, did you, was it important to you to, A, do something different with the second season, and B, as a producer, you know, to put you, to be a producer on it. Was mm -hmm. that a, a, an important thing to you? Yeah, absolutely. And I felt like in the first season, we were trying to find our footing as producers, but the second season, I, we also started super duper COVID days. So it felt, it felt like trying to get dressed in the dark. It was very strange. So much testing, so much masking, so much, it was very intense. Yeah, it's hard. It was hard and it, you know, uh, so much of any job that requires you to be around other people, requires you to see their noses and mouths and like, or, I think or, or cohabitate. Mas masking seems so intense now when you think about it. It how, does, and I also how feel like- fearful everyone was also. There when was you so think about fear. all of us in here having them, yeah, as, a, as opposed to, it, it was intense. Yeah. It was different, it was just different. It was just, a, it was, I was on high alert in a way that felt bad and scared all the time. Um, and so it was hard to work that way. And then you'd hear of one person getting it. It was like it was okay. the most terrifying feeling. Like you just felt like you heard the sirens. And the next thing you know, like it, it, it was terrifying because no one knew really what was going on. Yeah. So it was a lot of and the no fear one knew when it was going to end. I mean, and it's not still that going it's on, and it's yeah. like fuck it. I know. I got a life. I got to live. But. Um, yeah. I think um, I think the second season we uh, it felt like we could kind of breathe a little bit more, and I purposely wanted it to have that levity. And I really just wanted I wanted more comedy. I'm always I, I'm always the annoying push person pushing for more comedy every season. And I'm going you know if we do a third season, I'm going to be pushing a lot more. I'm always throwing stuff out there. I just want it to get goofier, funnier, you know, um, all the all the opportunities to take to do that is is what what I want. When as a producer, did you have a lot to do with casting, or did you? I did have some some yeah. We definitely they were they were actually really lovely with me about. I never if the first season I didn't know how much to to stand my ground, but I asked for Ron Funches. I just find him to be incredibly funny. Yeah. As a human being. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to be, I wanted him to be there somehow. And Nat Faxon and I, I mean, we were in the Growlings together when we were kids and. We were very romantic. <laughs> which, <laughs> which is good acting. <laughs> but um, I mean, he's like my, my little brother. But yeah, um, yeah you know, it, it's just nice to have that connection with somebody. We know each other so, so well. Um, so it's just so, I, you know, I was lucky to, I mean, I didn't know a lot of the rest of the cast, but I fell in love with so many of them. Michaela J found, fell in love with her and um, just thought there was something really exciting about, she wasn't at all the way it was written. We were sort of like, um, um, we were thinking of somebody far more in, intense and she's got an intensity, but she's got this like unbelievable heart to her that even when she's serious and tough, it's it's impossible not to feel it. Um, so, yeah. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you some fun questions. Oh. What's your go-to karaoke song? It used to be White Rabbit. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it, it builds. But that's so trippy. Yeah, it's a weird <laughs> one. I know, I haven't done karaoke in a long time. Cause I burned out on it really hard back in the day. You like, like really did your. I did it so much because what once I like in my twenties I found like the 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 private rooms. Yes. And I overdid it. I'm the problem is <laughs> I'm um I'm a very supportive karaoke singer so I sing and then I root the other person <laughs> on too much and it it really bothers me about myself. <laughs> Why? It's just I lose my voice and it's it's just too loud. It's too much. I lost the like excitement for it. Like I don't want to be phony. It's like when someone says, "Come on, you should dance," and you don't want to dance. Like exactly. I don't want to dance. 
The guy who invented karaoke just died. What? Yes, he died last week. <laughs> yeah. He now was like, I feel horrible. He was like, <laughs> he was very old. How old? What, how like old in was his he? 90s. He oh, was, wow, that's yeah. pretty wonderful. He lived a life of karaoke. <laughs> was his name <laughs> Professor what? Karaoke? No, it was Japanese, but no, his karaoke? name was not. Yes. Um, <laughs> I speak a little bit of Japanese. Yes. My yes. stepmother's Japanese. I'm not like ah. trying to. I speak shitty, shitty <laughs> Japanese, but I speak some. What's your secret skill? What are you good at that we'd be surprised to know you're I'm good I'm very at? good with languages, weirdly. Yeah. W weirdly very good with languages. Like, what's your favorite language to speak? I mean, I studied, I studied uh, French uh -huh. growing up. So when I go there, I, I kind of understand it. Um, I was just watching Anatomy of a Fall on the plane, and I was like, ooh, I'm kind of picking up on some of this without the <laughs> subtitles. <laughs> but then I'll forget it. But Japanese is close to impossible um, to remember. If, you, if you're not speaking it all the time, it's hard. But I can pick it up. I can make it sound like I can speak it. I speak really good Spanish, but I never study Spanish. It's just growing up in L.A. And also, you probably have a good ear because you're so, musical. I have a good ear. But what's another, what's another fun skill that the kids don't know about, you <laughs> think? Um, I'll give you some examples of things people have told me. About me? No, about their secret skills. Oh, let's hear it. <laughs> like, Kate Blanchett taught her dog to be like a cat, a cat to be like a dog. <laughs> How? Yeah. Stephen Yen can always find parking places. OK, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I I never forget a uh, face. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. But I, mean, I forget names all the time. <laughs> <laughs> never forget a face. I can forget a face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've probably forgotten a couple, but maybe it was a good <laughs> it was a good thing. Um, let me think. What else? That's enough. You have enough. That's Is that good. enough? That's enough. You probably okay. have a million more as a mom that you don't even think about that you're good at. Well, I'm certainly good at faking it. That's, I mean, <laughs> I think that's like the number one parent skill is like. But you're probably good at like fixing boo-boos and things like that, yeah. which is, you know. I wish I didn't panic as much as I panic. I would like to work on that. I think that my first reaction is like, what's happening? <laughs> it's like, just, you're not supposed to panic. They're supposed to panic. You're supposed to be calm. Who was your cinematic crush when you were growing up? Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder. <laughs> in what in in what movie? Uh, Young Frankenstein and Blazing Saddles. Ah. I thought he was really hot. <laughs> 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 I still do. I mean, yeah, I mean, young Gene Wilder in in um, Young Frankenstein is terribly handsome. And did you have posters of Gene Wilder on your wall? No, I wish I wish they'd made them. Maybe we should do that. We should make those. <laughs> what did you have posters on your wall of? I had, um, I was really into like the 50s for a while. <laughs> so I had like, uh, like James Dean and, and, and like that, but like a cool James Dean. I lived in Westwood. Um, which is like the, the college town for UCLA. And there were, um, and then the 80s, it was like the, it was like American Graffiti. It was like where all the kids hung out. It was so cool. And there were poster stores. Oh, yeah. We had Poster Mat, which I'm yeah. sure is the, you know, the equivalent of something on the East Coast that's like I've heard of the other places like it. But they had, you know, all the cool pins and candy and you could make your own iron on T-shirts and posters. And I did have a Jennifer Beals flash dance poster above my bunk bed. I didn't know she was mixed. I just thought she was pretty, but. All kind of makes sense now. And did you do the T-shirt? Did you do? Oh the yeah. Well, at my camp, we it was uh, banned. We weren't allowed to cut our sweatshirts at my sleep <laughs> sleepaway camp. <laughs> but yes, I definitely cut my cut my sweatshirts. Um, yeah, but I was also like, you know, I went through my like. I wouldn't say it was like it was more of a new wave. It wasn't a. I was never punk, but like. Definitely had a new wavey kind of. It was L.A. in the '80s. Was very right. was I feel like was a bit punk in and of itself. L.A. locals are very different than what people think of when they think of Los Angeles. They're like me. They're very... Um, I'm an L.A. local. That's right. <laughs> I always forget that. Yeah, people always think Well, I'm you're such New a New Yorker to me. I and know. people think I'm a New Yorker. Yeah. I know I lived here for many years, and I take it as an enormous compliment. I do, too. Um, but I don't... Uh, but yeah, I'm an, I'm an L.A. I'm like a, I'm a, I'm an L.A. native. 
So since this is a SAG screening, what was the thing that got you your SAG card? I'm pretty positive SAG, it was... not screening, SAG talk. Talking? Yeah, talking, SAG talking. Screening. Um, I'm pretty positive it was the movie As Good As It Gets. Oh, what did you play in As Good As It Gets? I was a police officer. Really? And I At said, what point are you they want the you inside, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to audition to do that? Yes, for, for Jim Brooks. For Jim Brooks. In the parking lot. Wow. <laughs> I think the person, uh, the man that was going to play it got sick. <laughs> and I don't remember how that happened. But to be honest with you, I think the first thing I did before that, but I didn't speak, was Gattaca. I was a nurse. You were a nurse in Gattaca? Yes. So I delivered Ethan Hawke. <laughs> That's kind of fun. Yeah, but yeah. it was a real baby, and they slathered it in cream cheese and um, <laughs> and strawberry jam. Oh really? Mm -hmm. And it was like a little baby? It was a little baby. Oh, my God. That's a very intense place to begin. I think so, too. I would be scared if that were my baby. Like, can, please don't drop my slippery baby. So somebody was, gave you the baby? Yeah, because I was supposed to, I was a delivery nurse, so I was supposed to have, like, taken it straight out of the chute over to the, like <laughs> the warming bed or whatever yeah so like full on full and on wet baby was standing nearby while this went yeah on. oh my god what a place to begin and then a cop and then a cop <laughs> i yeah so you didn't get your sad card for delivering a baby but you got your sad i don't sad. remember i think because like because you have to speak right i think you yes have to. you have to speak i was doing a lot of like um in the, um, I, I could be, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember what my first job was. I used to do a lot of commercials and music videos. Oh, you did? In the old days. What yeah. was your best commercial? I think it was a Miller beer commercial. <laughs> you probably made a lot on that. I don't think we did. I think it was kind of one of those bullshit things where they were like, let's get a group of kids <laughs> and we'll pay them all like a flat rate. <laughs> They'll be hanging out. <laughs> but I didn't speak. I think if you're ah. speaking, it's different. But you did, and you did music. What music videos did you do? Um, I did a lot in those days. I'm trying to remember. Um, that sounds like it was fun, no? What was that? Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. But there was one I hid out in my car all night. It was like a Dr. Dre video, and they wanted us walking. They were like there were porta potties, and there was water, and I <laughs> there were helicopters, and I hid in my car until the until the sun came up, and I got my check, and I went home. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't feel very safe. It did not feel safe. I was a young lady. Um, were these auditions or were this? No, like, I was in them. Oh, wow. Again, it was like you're 22 and you get like a flat. It was like a bunch of kids. I mean, those were very much the heyday days of videos, especially in L.A. Yeah. I used to do a lot of um I actually did a lot of costumes. I was a costume assistant for many years oh, wow. on a lot of music videos and stuff like that. And a lot of people, a lot of my friends were working on them and and stuff, so I do that, and then sometimes I'd be in them. And did you think at that point of like doing a TV show or anything, or were you always focused on comedy? And I really knew I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. Uh -huh. I, I sort of, I had, I had, had a, a vision. Yeah, like right out of college, my dad said, what do you want to do for a job? And I said, I want to be on Saturday Night Live. And he said, great, what are you going to do for money? Like, <laughs> OK, and so I started assisting. Um, costume design. Costume, yeah. Wow. All right, well, I think that we could talk all night, but I, I think know, that they nice want to talk us. To this you. is so fun to, to Thank talk. you for indulging us, because after a while, I feel like. <laughs> no, no, this was great, wasn't it? It was fantastic. Yeah.